Jacob, who is called Israel, is going to make a deal to try to deal with his brother who he ripped off for many years. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery Television, taking you through the Bible in one year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 as we do that, our 33rd year. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, about three minutes time, we'll be teaching on that, Genesis chapter 32. But first, here's Corey. I'm gonna be taking a look at the city of Shechem that shows up in our assigned reading today. Ryan? Today, my topic of study is the Dinah incident recorded in Genesis chapter 34. It would be something Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, would later come to really regret. Yeah, that was a bad situation. Okay, we'll be looking forward to that coming up in about 20 minutes time. Janice? Today, come as you are. All right, so all of this and more is coming up through the next half hour. Join us as we explore this passage of scripture, but let's open the Bible and listen to what God is saying to us. Genesis 32, 1 through 12. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find favor in your sight. Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is also coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. And he said, If Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Genesis chapter 32, verses 1 through 12. Genesis 32, Genesis 33, and 34 is what we read today as we continue going through the Bible. It's very, very important that we hear the details that the Holy Spirit has placed here for us to understand. Now, let's remember that culture is different that we're looking at, but God uses this opportunity in the culture to communicate his morality. Very interesting. Now, when we hear, have faith, Many think that that means that we must become super, super apostles of some kind of faith. Yet God tells us that faith is not something that we may have very much of. In fact, we don't need to have much faith to accomplish much. When the apostles asked Jesus Christ to increase their faith, he told them, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, that they could say to a tree, be pulled up and set your roots and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. That's in Luke chapter 17, verse six. That's a small size faith and it's enough for God's Holy Spirit. A father brought his ailing son to Jesus for healing. And Jesus told him that if he could believe, all things are possible. Now the scripture says that immediately the father cried out, Lord, I believe, 
help my unbelief. Mark chapter 9, verse 24. You know, there are times when we too don't have much faith. In a similar way, Jacob was told to go back to his brother Esau, whom he had done wrong with all of his life. God assured Jacob that he would provide the grace and the protection that he required. Jacob needed to place his faith in God. Place his faith in God. And you've heard this story before. I've said it many times. A missionary came through our church one time and said, you guys know how to love the Lord, but do you know how to trust in the Lord? Well, faith covers that, expresses our love towards God, but also our trust in God. Like the $1 bill and the American money says, in God we trust. Very, very important. Well, today, take your Bible guide and turn to the passage. We're going to be talking about Genesis 32, verses 1 through 12. Take your Bible, the most important book of all, and turn as well to that as we pray and ask God to help us. And if you don't have a Bible guide, here's my question. It's going to come. Why not? Uh, get a Bible guide, write to us or call us or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the Bible guide and it'll take you to a page where you can make a donation. Thank you so much for your faithful and steady donations. They keep us going. Now, Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us to hear what you say in terms of real faith. Help us to understand you because Holy Spirit, these are your words and we're listening. And Father, we may not be listening right, but help us to listen and make it right in Jesus' name. And we said together, amen and amen. Now, with that in mind, we move to Genesis chapter 32, which says, So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Now, this is fascinating because Jacob was a ripoff. He ripped off his brother all his life. His brother wasn't that well as a brother either. Jacob attempted to buy off his brother. God did not tell him to do that. God did not say to Jacob, go buy off your brother. Now, sometimes we do things God has not told us to do and when it doesn't turn out right, well, we blame him. Well, God, it's your fault. It's your fault, Lord. Well, hold on a minute. Did God tell us to do that or did we just do that because we thought that was a good thing to do? Now, that's a really good question, isn't it? So let's remember that because that's exactly what Jacob was doing. Now, let's go back to the scripture and learn more. Verse 32 or verse 6, verse 30, chapter 32. Then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is also coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him, Jacob. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he delivered the people that were with him and the flocks or divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. He's making ways now. Jacob assumed his brother Esau was coming to kill him and, and destroy him after years. You see, when we typically think worse of, in the worst case scenario, but God protects those who trust him. Now we think, oh no, this is going to happen, or that's going to happen, or it's going to be bad, we're gonna, and we're going to have a bad situation, but, 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 but hold on a minute. God knows our future. God's plans for us have never changed. They are the same. What are those plans? Well, whatever they are, they are approved by God. So if we've been hurt, if we've been devastated by people, God has given the ability for us to heal. Now, that's very important to remember because we have to think that way. And that's, that's differently. That's thinking in faith. 
Okay. Now we go to verse nine. Watch this. Then Jacob said, O God of my father, Abraham and God of my father, Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. God told him to do that. I am not worthy of the least of all of the mercies and of all of the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, O God. Deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him lest he come and attack me and the mother of my children. For you said, I will surely treat you well. You said it, Lord, and make your, your descendants as sands of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. Fascinating. Jacob prayed to God again, asking him to do what he said he would do. <laughs> you know, there are times when we pray to reassure ourselves and our insecurities. God understands. Let me tell you something. I have prayed many times, Lord, you said this. Now I'm going into a bad situation. You got to help me. So when I pray that, I, I realize that the Lord has already helped me. Even though it doesn't look that way, God has helped me. Now let me ask you this question. Are you facing something devastating, something terrible, something horrible? You can't find a way out. Let's invite the Lord Jesus into that and let him rescue us. Father, we pray today, help us. And we've got ourselves into this, Lord, and we need your help. And we give our lives to you. Help us to get out of it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we all said together, amen. Welcome back to the program. Today our reading is Genesis chapters 32 through 34, and this time through I'm focusing on chapter 34, which records the unfortunate Dinah incident. And Dinah was the daughter of Jacob and Leah. And in this passage, she's sexually violated by a foreigner, which causes her brothers, Simeon and Levi, to react rashly. As a matter of fact, they end up totally destroying not only the perpetrator, but also his people too, which absolutely infuriates Jacob. But when we get to the end of this chapter, Jacob does nothing. It won't be until Genesis chapter 49 that their judgment is pronounced. Check it out. In Genesis chapter 49, the dying Jacob calls for his sons to proclaim a final blessing upon them. However, this will be much more than the standard patriarchal blessing. This will be a prophecy that will develop in the course of the history of the 12 tribes. In fact, for Simeon and Levi, this would be no blessing at all. Beginning in verse 5, Jacob addresses both sons. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger, and hawked oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce, and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob, and disperse them in Israel. Jacob begins this declaration to Simeon and Levi by stating their relationship. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Indeed, these two were full brothers, both sons of Jacob's wife Leah. Their swords are weapons of violence, remarks Jacob. Here, Jacob notes their unhealthy predisposition towards violence, a reference to their earlier vengeance against the city of Shechem for their sister's rape. For this, Jacob disassociates himself from the deeds of Simeon and Levi. Let me not enter their council, he proclaims. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger and hawked oxen as they pleased. For the rape of Dinah, Simeon and Levi conspired together and slaughtered every male in the city of Shechem and hawked their oxen to boot. To hawk an animal means to cut the tendons of the ox 
so that they could no longer continue working. So rather than taking the oxen as spoil, they maimed them, rendering them both useless and helpless. Cursed be their anger, declares Jacob, so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. In keeping with the judgment, neither tribe received its own territory in the promised land. Their territories were within the territory of other tribes. They did not receive their own tribal holdings. Simeon turned out to be the weakest tribe in number. In the first census, his tribe numbered 59,300. But in the second census, it went all the way down to 22,200. And interestingly, Simeon is altogether omitted from the tribal blessings of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 33. When the Jews did get the land of Israel, Simeon settled not in his own territory, but in the southern part of Judah's territory. As far as Levi is concerned, his tribe did side with Moses in the sin of the golden calf, but in keeping with Jacob's curse, Levi did not receive his own territory. Rather, the tribe of Levi was scattered in 48 different Levitical cities throughout the other tribes of Israel. So because of the actions of Simeon and Levi against Shechem, their descendants would pay the consequences, and they did. The tribe of Simeon became the least in number, and the Levites never received their own inheritance. Now, fortunately, the tribe of Levi did side with Moses in the sin of the golden calf, and so they were set apart later for God's special service. Still, this Dinah incident wasn't a good situation. No, it wasn't, and there's a lot of violence just released on the people for that reason. And uh, it's, it's as if they, they got mad and they just took it out on them, you know, they just went like that. Yeah. And that was a problem. And I mean, I understand it. We get the emotion, we get the feeling, yeah. right? But there's what we want to do, and then there's what's right. Well, yeah, and I yeah. think, and and I think too, with the brothers, a, a huge part of their sin was even just going against Jacob, because as mm. the patriarch in that society, whether you disagreed with him or not, legally it was supposed to be him who made the deal. So if he had said, "Let's wipe everyone out in Shechem," that would have been a different story. Wouldn't have made it morally mm -hmm. right in terms of murder, but it would have gotten the brothers off the hook, right. the yeah. sons of Jacob off the That's hook. That's a good point. Yeah, right. But he not only are they guilty of murder, but they're also guilty of disobeying their patriarch, who is supposed to be their legal authority. So they're not honoring their mm. father in that, which was a big no-no. Genesis 49 has the results of that. It's going to be very interesting as we read it, but Corey? Okay, so I, I kind of want to continue talking about what was going on with Jacob and his sons here, uh, because Jacob's strategy was one of alliance. We, we you know, he's had this really interesting moment uh, with God right before this, where Jacob has always been this wrestler, this struggler, this usurper, and it has a negative connotation, a deceiver, uh, his name has this negative connotation. But when God meets him before he's allowed to go back into the promised land to be, you know, the the uh, the, the next uh, patriarch to take on the covenant between God and Abraham, God confronts him and actually has him physically wrestle with him uh, in order to change him, to, to bring about a change in his character. And now his name is not this negative connotation of deceiver and wrestler, but now his name literally means God struggles or God strives for. So it would, it would remind Jacob of the incident of God wrestling with him, but it would also uh, foreshadow that it was now God who would struggle to protect and provide for Jacob, for Israel and his family. And we see this in the, the, the Shechem incident because there should have been retribution from other tribes, but what does Genesis 34 say. It says that God caused a fear and a terror of Israel and his sons to come on the other people around them so that they did not attack him. So we see God is contending and striving for Jacob. With all of that being said, let's take a look at this really interesting place where all of this went down, the city of Shechem. With 60 mentions from the pages of the Old Testament of the Bible, the city of Shechem ranks among the most important cities of the historic land of Israel. Located in Israel's central hill country and at the division of a major road, Shechem was flanked by the two tallest mountains in the area, Mount Abal to the north and Mount Gerizim to the south. Its arrangement in this narrow valley pass likely accounts for its name, which in Hebrew means back or shoulder. 
Today, Shechem has been identified as Tel Balada in the modern city of Nablus and has been the focus of much archaeological survey and excavation. Shechem's first mention in the Bible comes from Genesis 12 as the place where Abram received a promise from a god that the land of Canaan would one day belong to his descendants. Abram then built an altar at Shechem. Noticeably absent in this report is a fortified city, further explained by archaeological work which tells us that Shechem wasn't fortified until just before Abram's grandson Jacob visited. Jacob's visit saw him camping in front of the fortified city, purchasing a plot of land, and building another altar to God. Later in biblical history, at the command of Moses, Joshua read the book of the law to the Israelites at Shechem, standing on Mount Ebal, which even today acts as a natural amphitheater. Shechem was then made a Levitical city of refuge, and after another covenant renewal ceremony, the bones of Joseph brought out of Egypt were laid to rest there. In the time period of the judges, Gideon's son Abimelech had himself named king, by force, at Shechem, and ended up murdering around a thousand Shechemites for betraying him, and then destroying the city. During the time period of the kings, Jeroboam I rebuilt Shechem as the capital city of northern Israel. And by the time of Christ, ancient Shechem had been in ruins since the Assyrian invasion of northern Israel. And the ruins of a Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim were still visible from Jacob's well, where Jesus famously claimed to be the Messiah. So there we go. This city does not have, uh, you know, nice, good, upstanding history with Israel. It has some good points and some really low points, but it becomes a very important city later on uh, after the conquest of Joshua. Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you, Corey, for that. Really appreciate it. Janice? Well, I titled my segment today, Come As You Are, because as I'm looking at this chapter, we have Jacob, who in the past has really mistreated his brother Esau, and we've learned about all of the happenings between those brothers. And now he's very fearful because he needs to meet up with Esau. And um, we don't know what the heart of Esau is either as we're reading through this. And what we see is a Jacob who sends a messengers before himself to use words to try to encourage. He uses things like, I'm your servant. He, he says, tell, tell him in, in these words that I'm, I'm your servant. I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. Thus your servant Jacob says. And then he says, tell him that I've got oxen and donkeys and flocks. And he goes through this whole routine of what he thinks he needs to do to be able to approach Esau because he knows he's guilty. He knows he's afraid. Now he has things that he needs to protect. He's got his, his, his family, his children, and he wants to be able to protect them and he's afraid. And it comes to this in verse five. And this was the key verse that, that struck me this time. I have oxen, donkeys, and flocks. He's going through everything. And it says, And I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. He's trying to prepare everything, the right words. What should I say? And get himself ready so that he can meet Esau and find favor. And you know what? It really reminded me a lot of people who think that we have to prepare ourselves with the right words and we have to clean ourselves up and bring things to God so that he can forgive us and that he can accept us because we know when we come to God that we're guilty. We know that. We know that we haven't lived right. That's that conviction that we feel in our hearts. And we know that if we can just, or we think that, if we can just bring a bunch of things to God or, or clean ourselves up, if, 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 I, if I have addictions in certain areas, if I, if I can just clean that up, then I can come to God and then he'll accept me. But let me assure you, dear one out there who you know exactly what I'm talking about. Let me assure you that God says, come to me. God already sees our guilt. God already knows what we've done. And listen, if we could clean ourselves up by ourselves, we wouldn't need God, would we? We wouldn't have needed Jesus to come and make that sacrifice for us. And when we give ourselves to Jesus, he has already done the work on the cross for us. He says, you come to me as you are. 
And all we have to do is come before God with an honest and open heart and say, forgive me. Father, I know that I've done wrong. Forgive me and accept me. I thank you for dying on the cross for me and saving my sins, saving me from my sins. And that's all you need to bring is yourself the way you are. Come to Jesus today as you are. Ask him to forgive you. Tell him that you recognize the fact that he died for you and ask him to come into your heart. And you know what? If you mean that, dear one, he will come in and he will begin to help you. As you follow him, as you get into his word, he will be the one together with you to bring the changes about. And he's not going to just change you over overnight. Wouldn't that be nice? But he would. he's going to help you on the walk, just as he helps us sitting here at this table. We are all a work in progress. And as this is what this program is all about, getting into his word, learning who God is and how much he loves us. John 3, 16 is a wonderful verse. Go there. The book of John is a wonderful book for you to start in, in the word of God. And join us if you can every day in the word of God, and we will grow together in God. Come to him just as you are. I do a lot of ask the pastor questions and answer them on my YouTube channel. And I want to invite you to join, look up Pastor Rod Hembry on YouTube, Pastor Rod Hembry, and I'll answer the questions. And if you have a question, you can put it there, just subscribe to the service. And we wanna welcome you to that. Today we need to pray, Lord, I, I need to trust you more. Help us, Father, help us to trust you more. Help me to learn and grow the way that you desired me to grow in Jesus' name. 